Well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope that the inner experience that I've been having while watching these fantastic panels over the last two days mirrors yours, which is sort of a state of, of encouragement and then discouragement and then encouragement, often kind of within 60 second periods. So uh, listening to that wonderful previous um, conversation uh, between Dylan and Francis Haugen, uh, one has to feel encouraged even as one quickly feels discouraged and back again. And I think it's important with the kind of bipolar um, framing of this conference between rage and reason that we recognize that there is potential within those two spaces for something livable. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And I, I would like to uh, bring our attention to the beginning of the conference, which is when Roger started us with um, rage, sing, goddess, Achilles rage, black and murderous, that cost the Greeks incalculable pain, pitched countless souls of heroes into Hades dark, and left their bodies to rot as feasts for dogs and birds, as Zeus and his will was done. It's a translation of the first lines of uh, Iliad, uh, an epic poem in 15,693 lines by uh, the poet we call Homer. Um, Roger started us there. Uh, the first word of the poem in Greek is rage. And as this is a foundational text in Western literature, we could say that the cornerstone of Western literature is a consideration of rage. Leaping ahead to Homer's uh, so-called next epic, um, which is Odyssey, which follows chronologically from Iliad, the story of a part of the fall of Troy. The Odyssey, the story of part of a journey by one of uh, the Greeks warriors, um, Odysseus, um, a very clever fellow, uh, back home, the American critic Guy Davenport says that um, the Iliad is a poem about force, and the Odyssey is a poem about the mind's ability to conquer force. And those two texts now, foundational in rage and then foundational in reason, make this kind of what we might call arbitrary framing, not at all arbitrary. We could say that the Western idea of human dealings pivots there. Epic poems by Homer um, and subsequent epic poems that are lost were not texts, they were sounds. They were delivered aloud by uh, professional people called rhapsodes, and rhapsode comes from a Greek word which I won't try to pronounce because I'm not a classicist and my classicist friends here will will shun me uh, publicly and shame me, as they should. Um, it means to sew songs together. So we should rid ourselves of this idea that these are poems in the sense of written things on paper that in isolation we sit and appreciate, which of course is something we should do. However, we should recognize that foundationally poetry was sung and that if you can imagine that the job of someone was to recite from memory nearly 16,000 lines. How would that happen? The Odyssey and the Iliad are um, divided into 24 books. We do not know in each case whether those were decisions that were from the time of their recitation or whether those books so-called were divided many years after, hundreds of years after when they were actually transcribed. What we do know is these episodes, say in the Iliad, 24 chapters, each of equivalent length, could be recited in an evening. So were you to wish to hear the Iliad, you would have to sit or have the pleasure of sitting and having someone recite to you every night for 24 days. You would take that in with your body. You would hear it, the little hairs in your ears that are responsible for hearing would, would grant you the privilege of being connected to another intelligence directly through your body. The poet Frank O'Hara, at the end of a great poem, says the only truth is face to face. And we might say the only truth is voice to voice. We are sound bodies, we resonate, we come into this world naked and screaming, that's our first song. It's a song that does not have words. So those songs uh, become language that's focused 
examples of sound that differentiate ideas one to another. Language then becomes not auditory, but text-based. We learn to read texts. Um, and rapidly, you know, text become hypertext in our lifetime, becomes texts uh, that we send, uh, which becomes um, posting and then uh, shaming and then canceling and then raging. And then here we are, welcome. A uh, philosopher more quoted by people like me, uh, sorry, a senior fellow, Arn Center, writer in residence here, mostly spend my time writing literary criticism for the general public. People like me, so-called, love to quote uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein um, because they don't understand philosophy. That would be me of that level. Um, and his poem, The Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, is a wonderful poem to quote from in ignorance because it has so many phrases which one can meditate over like koans, and I have, and so I mock this attitude, but I also want to assure you that it's not something we should mock. Um, one of my favorite of, of the things that I've extracted from the Tractatus, which is the logical philosophical track, um, which again, I don't understand, um, is the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. The limits of my language mean the limits of my world. That's a translation, okay? He wrote in German, so I, I don't have the ability to offer anything better than that. It's interesting, we can look at that two ways, can't we? Uh, this idea of limits. The limits of my language mean the limits of my world. Well, then shouldn't we free ourselves of the limits of language by internalizing as much language as possible, by being able to express ourselves with extreme subtlety and grace, so that we may differentiate between emotional and intellectual states. Or, in that limitless absorption of language, are we positioning ourselves in a way where it's easy to falsify feeling, easy to, dis to cloak um, meaning, true meaning, true feeling, from not only others, but from ourselves? And when we limit language, wouldn't we do better if we, the limits of our language are the limits of our world to communicate in as clear and straightforward a manner as possible. What would that mean? Language is a system. We agree on it. We agree on a grammar, a grammar that will allow us to be clear, is the hope. And we agree on meanings of words, which we then attempt to define through their use. I was really struck by Francis Huggins' idea of our having with Facebook a system problem or with social media companies in the, in the aggregate um, and how we have to approach these as, as system problems. And I was encouraged by what she had to say, as I did by Colin McGill uh, in his presentation earlier of, the, of, his, of his project Polis on constitutional democratic uh, uh, progress. And, um, I think that's all true, but I think the system problem we really have is language. Everything that we're, we're moving through in these two days is, a, is ultimately a language problem. A post on Twitter is a language problem, isn't it? A response is, etc. And that system problem does have solutions. I return us to song. I return us to the idea of having a body that vibrates when we actually hear something that has meaning and is meaningful to us by virtue of how we feel it, okay? Feelings that are more complicated than simply the first word in the Iliad. One solution then is song. And uh, I have the honor of both introducing a very young and an encouragingly excellent uh, American Afghan writer, Jamil John Kochai will be uh, giving us the pleasure of a reading of uh, one story, which will take about 15 minutes, and then he and I will speak for a few minutes, and then, of course, as you would expect, you will be able to ask him questions. A few words uh, about Mr. Kochai. He was born in 1992 in a refugee camp in Peshawar, Pakistan, to Afghan Pashtun parents, and 12 stories, which are uh, recent, just published in The Haunting of Haji Hotok, are set in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the Bay Area, and their location, locations that track close to his family history. His father left his native country of Afghanistan in 1982 during the Soviet occupation, 
And uh, his father made his way to Alabama to start a new life, then returned to the Logar province, uh, where his family uh, hails from in the late 80s. He wanted to start a family. Um, he met his wife there, and uh, they attempted emigration and um, found themselves in a camp in Peshawar, Pakistan, where Mr. Kochai was born. Um, a definition of song in the dictionary of, of your Apple computer that comes from actually Oxford is to articulate or utter words or sounds in succession with musical inflections or modulations of the voice so as to produce an effect entirely different from that of ordinary speech to do this in a skilled manner as a result of training and practice. I do not hesitate to call the 12 stories in the haunting of Haji Hotak songs. And um, he's been laureled, Mr. Kochai has. Uh, his first novel, 99 Nights in Logar, was a finalist for the Penn Hemingway Award. His stories appear in The New Yorker for the most part. Um, he's won a Best American, he's been included in the Best American collections, the O'Henry collections and has won a number of prizes, which are only the beginning of a long and fruitful literary career. I ask you to welcome him warmly as he reads for us, won't you? Thank you, Wyatt, for that um, beautiful, beautiful introduction. Um, and I want to thank um, all the organizers for this conference for inviting me here today. Um, it's an honor. <clears throat> uh, the story is called Enough. Rangina does not know what to say to her brute of a son who will not stop shouting about pills or land or a stolen envelope of cash she meant to donate to the orphans of Logar because he's rambling now, absolutely rambling in front of her beloved daughters come all the way from Fremont to visit Rangina in this lonesome living room. Her son has decided to paint the most despicable shade of blue, just sitting there, the poor girls, watching their old mother get harangued by her only living son on the earth, who is shouting, I found the torn envelope in your drawer of photos, and of course there's no way for her to respond to all of his accusations without weeping like the child she had been once married off to a 60-year-old nomad at the precious age of 15 or 14 or who knows how old exactly, though Rangina did recall she was not too old to be playing with the dolls she fashioned out of clay from the edges of the rivers near where her youngest son would one day be murdered when her mother approached her in a coat of ash or dust or snowflakes and informed her that within the year she would be married and moved and pregnant, again and again pregnant, leading to so many little unmarked graves in the apple orchard beneath the falling blossoms, as if Allah, all praise be to him, were saying, look, I know, I know, but then there's this, until the baby stopped dying with the birth of her eldest son, the survivor, the rambler, still somehow rambling beneath the half-lit ceiling light he has failed to fix for the past three months, no matter how many times Rangina moans, this darkness will swallow me, his massive frame blocking the television and the fake fireplace in the cabinet containing Rangina's favorite photograph of Watak, his head shaved, his mustache barely sprouted, his soft lashes sparkling with frost, his lips slightly parted as if he is about to speak. But then his older brother, the survivor, speaks in his place, rambling about the pink pills from Target CVS instead of the pharmacy at Rayleigh's, which was where Dr. Ahmad Z had sent all her medications before he died, before her eldest son moved the family out of their three-bedroom house in Broderick to their five-bedroom house in Bridgeway, despite the fact that she secretly preferred the smaller house and the bigger bedroom she shared with her eldest grandson, just six at the time, and so meek and so gentle, he would hold her hand every night to fall asleep. And then there were the ancient oak trees in the backyard and Faisal Market down the road, only a mile or so, a 15-minute walk for some dried mulberries or kishmish or fresh bread or a conversation with another Afghan. While in Bridgeway, she was surrounded for miles by nothing but houses, her white neighbors and their houses, her white neighbors and their dogs and their houses, their vicious dogs, always barking, always yapping and lunging, always on the brink of tearing away from their owners to rip open her insides like she had seen the communist dogs do in the pits of the orchards where her children had picked apples while searching for her eldest son who, thank Allah, all praise be to him, 
was not eaten by those dogs or blown to pieces by the bombs or shot near the bank of a stream, her white neighbor's dogs preventing her from going outside and taking a walk and shedding the pounds piled up on her belly and back and thighs. And she supposes the valves of her heart Otherwise, why wouldn't her son stop rambling that she had forgotten to take her blood pressure meds or had accidentally hidden them in the sheets of her bed, only for her son's snoop of a wife to find them one day and claim that Rangina was hoarding them to gift to her only living sibling on the earth, who, yes, perhaps, is an addict and a swindler and a wife beater, but who also has very severe heart problems. And when you consider the state of Logar, that is, the ongoing years of bombings and shootings and random roadside executions, the Khalkyan, the Soviets, the Mujahideen, the Taliban, and the Americans. Well, how could you blame her poor brother for deciding to steal, is it even stealing, a small slice of the land that should rightfully belong as much to her as it does to her son, the rambler and his viper of a wife, always watching, always listening, whispering, informing Rangina's brute of a son whether or not Rangina is taking her pills or stockpiling her napkins or shutting off her oxygen tank to keep it from overheating or waking up in the night unable to breathe or telling the truth on the phone to her daughters or spitting loogies directly beneath the corners of the carpets where no one looks except, apparently, for her son's snoop of a wife, a Farsi one, you know, like Rangina's mother, a weak-willed woman, her son's wife laughs at everything, eats your insults, doesn't say shit to your face, but then reports every word back to her husband, who rushes Rangina, a big man, rambling about respect and kindness, though he certainly doesn't ramble very respectfully even now, even in this lonesome living room finally filled up with all her children, rambling in front of her beloved daughters come all the way from Fremont with their little babies just to see her, Rambling so loud she can barely hear Alex Trebek say, on October 7th, 2001, Operation Enduring Freedom began in this country. By December, the U.S. had dropped 12,000 bombs and missiles. With the weary resignation of a dying man, the same resignation she had seen in the long-haired boys she hid in her home, in the soft grass of the cow's pen, between ambushes and firefights, boys so young they could have been her sons, boys so beautiful they could have been dreams, all of them armed and dying and pretending to be prepared to die, and her son among them, her eldest son, just as beautiful, just as young, just as resigned to die in the wake of his younger brother's death, but now alive, now old, now ugly, now angry, now pacing up and down the living room, now yanking at his beard, now re-rambling along with her daughters, the traitors about the pink pills Rangina has inadvertently lost, the pills he says are for her heart, but which, in fact, Rangina found out were for her mind, picking up on the words anxiety and mania and panic, words she remembered and repeated to her daughters, her trusting daughters from whom she learned that the words referred to ailments of the mind, not the body, as if Rangina had become a madwoman, as if she couldn't beat her entire family at checkers, as if she weren't still memorizing suras every night and day, as if she weren't at the very peak of her mental faculties, no matter what her son's wife had to say behind her back when she was talking on the phone in the yard beneath the cherry tree all day in the yard or in her bedroom or at her brother's house, leaving Rangina most days all on her own in this house so empty, so dark, so quiet, her grandchildren in their bedrooms playing games, watching TikTok, leaving her alone with her couch and her breathing tubes and her television and her favorite photo of Watuk and her oxygen tank, which, she had heard, can sometimes randomly explode in this house made of sticks with its fence barely six feet high, barely an inch thick, completely incapable of protecting her from the neighbor's dogs or the registered sex offenders that live two blocks away, let alone burglars and rapists and Richard Ramirez and Eddie Gallagher and Robert Bales, nothing like the walls of her home in Logar, 20 feet high, four feet thick, and strong enough to withstand rockets and missiles and bullets from the communists coming for her second eldest son, Watak, whom, nonetheless, they kill, whom they killed, by the bank of a stream, near the water, rushing water, so heavy, so light, so early in the morning that frost still nipped the leaves and snowflakes fell mysteriously from the heavens as Allah, all praise be to him, had intended, had always intended. 
But then there she is, her son's wife, complaining in whispers to her traitorous daughters about having to constantly lift Rangina's oxygen tank onto her dresser, then back onto the floor, then back onto her dresser, then back onto the floor, about the aching in her wrists as if Rangina's withered lungs hadn't been ceaselessly aching since the night her body absorbed so much smoke and debris from Soviet cluster bombs. She had ash leaking out of her nose and ears and lips, a trail of ash following her from one end of the world to the other, from Logar to Peshawar to Birmingham to Hayward to Broderick to Bridgeway to her favorite seat just in front of the television, blocked by her rambling daughters and her rambling son, and now his rambling son, that is the very same grandson she had sung to sleep for five years, the same grandson whose ass she had wiped until he was in first grade, until they moved him into a room with his brothers in this too big house with its too many doors, too many windows, too many lights, too many televisions, too many memories, as in, for example, the night her son's wife discovered that her brothers had been murdered in Logar for nothing, for no one, in snowfall just a mile or so away from the spot where Watuk had been murdered for nothing, for no one, in snowfall. Forty years earlier, and Rangina held her son's wife in her lap and wanted very dearly to tell her the story of how her own younger brother, the jokester, the prankster, laughing at everything, inventing jokes out of dust, out of horror, out of sorrow, had been pinned one snowy day between two trucks in Kabul, how his internal organs had been crushed and bled, but his heart kept pumping just long enough for him to look about, to raise his arms, to gesture for help, and to whisper a final message into the icy ear of a stranger who disappears forever, who might be dead, who might be living, just walking and sleeping and praying and eating and dying with Rangina's beloved brother's final words, knocking about in his head with a summary of last week's episode of Erthogrol, just another memory, a story that begins, but once in Kabul, amid snowflakes, a dying boy gestured. Not knowing that the dying boy was Rangina's dying boy, that those words, that story, belonged to her, but of course she didn't remind her son's sobbing wife of the story of the death of her brother or the death of Watak because Rangina knew what nobody knew, the weight of his body heavy with water, because she had heard the gunshots from her home, because she had known it was him before she had known it was him, because she had rushed out onto the wartime roads like a mad woman, her hair unveiled, her nostrils burning with the stink of gunpowder and blood because Though Watuk was twice her size, she had lifted him out of the stream, all sodden and punctured, light as the day she had birthed him, because Allah, all praise be to him, grants power to his bereaved, because she was the first to find Watuk, as if he were waiting for her. Then, now, there, here, her boy, her boys, forever silent, forever rambling, and Rangina wonders how much longer she is supposed to just sit and suffer her entire family rising up against her before she says enough, before she shouts at her rambling son and his whispering wife and her nodding daughters and her muttering grandson, enough, enough rambling, enough advice, enough pills, enough nightmares, enough lung damage, enough ghosts, enough beautiful dying boys, enough bomb smoke, enough burning apple trees, enough staring white neighbors, enough heavy breathing, enough watak, enough panic attacks, enough addict brother calling for money, enough spite, enough grudges, enough heartaches, enough dead, enough sins, enough son's wife having to wash her in the tub because she can no longer stand up under her own weight, enough weight, enough waffles, enough watak, enough ongoing occupation, enough Taliban, enough Bushes, enough Clintons, enough Masoods, enough puppet presidents serving white masters, enough Watak, enough unanswered prayers, enough brothers' jokes turned into sad stories, enough aching in knees and back and lungs and heart, enough breathing tubes, enough inhalers, enough pills, enough beaten mothers, enough gunshots and films, enough wounded, enough babies dying, enough hateful eldest son, enough rambling, enough advising, enough calming, enough enough loving, enough hating, enough generations of grown children rambling, enough, Rangina shouts and rises up out of her seat and strips off her breathing tubes and limps outside, 
her children at her back, at her sides, circling and pleading and still somehow rambling, where, over and over, where? Her stupid children and her stupid grandchildren, her whole stupid family, too big, too small, too loud, too quiet, too fast, too slow. To Logar, she says, without saying, and climbs into one of her son's salvaged civic sedans and, crabs, and grabs the key out of the cup holder where he always keeps it and almost runs over her daughter, backing out of the driveway. She straightens the car in the cul-de-sac and spots her son running toward her from the house. Shifting the car into drive, she plans to head down Brother Island Road onto Golden Gate, onto Jefferson, onto the freeway, onto I-80, onto SFO, into the international terminal toward the Turkish Airlines ticket counter, where she'll unstitch a seam in her purse and pull out a stolen bundle of cash meant for the orphans of Logar and buy a first-class ticket to Afghanistan. In Kabul, she'll exchange her dollars for Afghanis and call for a tax and pay extra to travel down to Muhammad Agha, to her old village in Nawe Kale, to the bank of the stream where Watuk once died, and she'll climb past the Chinar trees and down into the water and stare up at the leaves and the birds and the clouds and the jets and the ghosts and the drones and the angels and the cosmos and Allah. All praise be to him. And she will float in peace and in silence except apparently for the blasting of a car horn her eldest son had failed to repair only days earlier. The same eldest son is now slumped beside Angina. In the salvage civic, she has just crashed into the pole of the lamplight she watches every night from her bedroom. The horn blares louder as the rest of her family surround her car and are once again, but her boy, her firstborn, the one who lived, through the cold, through the hunger, through the mountains, through the war, her survivor, her rambler, is so quiet, it stirs her dying body into action. Shards of windshield tumble from her arms and shoulders like the first snowflakes of a new season as she reaches out to feel for the pulse of her only living son on the earth. Thank you. Give this man a water yeah. ball. Is this okay? Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. What a story, and what a reading. Um, it's incredibly moving, and I think we should just feel that for a moment while we wait for the water bottle. I read that story several times. Um, I wrote a piece for uh, the New York Review of Books about about uh, Jamil's work, and um, I read the story several times, but to hear it is a different experience, which is not to say that it, the written form of it doesn't produce the same experience. It's a different experience. Um, to be in a room with the voice of the person who wrought it, we're gonna talk about this story, but I wanna begin, it's quite clear from the story that you have a deep, passionate, personal knowledge of what you write about. And I gave the teeny tiny thumbnail sketch of you know the trajectory of your family from Afghanistan to here. In all bios, you're listed as a you know Afghan-American writer, yeah? Um, can you talk about what it means to be, first and foremost, someone who comes from Afghanistan as you make your way to your art, which is the focus? But could you, would you mind beginning there? Yeah, of course. You know, um, I came to this country when I was a year and a half, um, but every couple of years, uh, my father was fairly adamant about uh, making sure we would, we would go back to Afghanistan, and so we would spend a few months there. Um, but even beyond that, I think, you know, uh, in my household, all of the stories, everything everyone always talked about 
was always rooted back in Afghanistan. And so from a very young age, I think, you know, the, the sort of the, the root of my literary imagination, I think, of my, my, uh, my drive towards storytelling, it was, it was all rooted in Afghanistan. It was all rooted in this small village in Logar that my mother and father and, and, and grandmother and my grandparents, that they all loved and that they had lost to this war. And so, um, you know, as I, as I was growing up here in this country and as you were, you know, you, you, you get, um, as you get older, you get these different um, artistic or uh, cultural depictions of Afghanistan. And, you know, it was largely very negative and um, it was largely focused on, on, on violence and on, you know, these, these enemies um, across the sea that had to be murdered. Um, but of course, you know, the, the stories that I had always grown up with, there, there, was, there was violence there and there was sorrow, but there was also, um, there was also immense joy and there was also, you know, uh, life there as well. And so um, much later in my life, as I, as I began pursuing this, this career in fiction writing, um, it, it just seemed very natural to begin writing about uh, Afghanistan first and foremost. And um, since then, I've sort of I've, I've ventured into different territories. I write a bit about Sacramento now. I write about, a bit about the Bay Area and Davis, and I've even got a story set in Iowa. But um, but Logat is where it all began. As a young man who uh, was growing into himself in the United States, you say you made these trips back to Afghanistan, and how important it was to your father and to your family to have that opportunity for you to, you know, understand your roots. How did it change for you um, two ways? One, you'd heard these stories then, and I think at a certain age, right, first grade or second grade, you spent an entire summer there, I think, for the first time, yeah? And your first novel depicts a three-month period um, of time in Afghanistan, which I don't want to superimpose over your life experience. But I would, I would wonder how, you know, we have narrative, we have storytelling that comes from the family tradition of orality. Homer comes out of orality, folklore comes out of orality, song comes out of orality. How did meeting reality, so-called, complicate or um, change the way that you understood what it meant to be from that place, what it meant to be displaced? I mean, that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, you know, this, this odd thing happened when, when I went to um, Afghanistan for the first time. It was, um, when, I was when I was six years old. We went to um, our home village in, in Logar. And the entire time that I spent there as a, six, a six-year-old, I just remember it being in, incredibly joyous. It was, it was the first time that I was surrounded by all these cousins and all these family members. And, um, and you know, I just I felt so deeply beloved there that it was this, it was this, um, it was this emotional sense that, that, struck, that stayed with me throughout my life. And so even at, from a very young age as I was growing up, you know, I, I, I associated, I think associated Logar with this, with this deep feeling of, of being loved. And so, you know, I think that, that only made me more interested in the, in the stories that I had grown up with. And so, you know, it, it, so I did come from this oral tradition of storytelling. And, and in fact, I would say that I was quite fortunate because my father and my mother and, and my grandmother especially, you know, they were fantastic storytellers. And all their stories were, were, were told to me in Pashto. And, um, and so, you know, I ended, up, I ended up carrying that with me into these different visits. And so I would go there and you know and and it and it did this thing where where I would go from location to location and I would try to rediscover the places and the stories and so I would you know I'd ask my father you know is this where you went to school is this where you you know you walk two miles every single day without any shoes and and is this where you know uh, you almost got killed by that camel is this where um or, or and of course you know is is this where Watuk died and so um all of those locations they took on this this added this added layer of meaning to me because I'd I'd already been gr growing up with them, and then and then over the course of my life, as I kept revisiting, um, it just it just kept becoming more and more monumental because it, the memories were piling up and the stories were piling up, and it, and it just became even more significant with time. And it's so interesting because you know one of the things that an imaginative writer, a fiction all writing is imagined. So let's just say a fiction writer in the conventional sense of somebody who is working from the imagination uh, and building the world from it. Um, one of the, the necessities for such a writer is the ability both to observe 
and then to depict what is observed so the reader can see it. I find fascinating, I imagine it, it just, it feels terribly unfair to anyone else who would write fiction that you had this whole real world that you were constantly fact-checking against the, the so-called fictional world of the oral tale. And so that you were, it was almost like you were in school for writing from being six. I think so, you know, but, but I do have to say, you know, that did come with this uh, very intense feeling of, um, you know, how, how would I phrase it? I, I, I constantly felt disappointed in my own depictions of, um, of Lo God. When I, when I first began writing seriously, you know, I'd grown up with such fantastic storytellers that, uh, that I, you know, I, I just, I always felt like my, my story, my tales, my stories never lived up to theirs. And, and when I wrote a scene in Lo God and when I would try to depict the landscape, it just, it never lived up to my own vision. And so, you know, I think perhaps that's, that's sort of rooted in, I think that might have actually assisted me in my, in my drive to continue writing Lo God just because I feel like I never get it quite right and I keep going back and I keep just getting re-mesmerized and then I'll write again and again it's not it's quite it's not quite right but um but but you know it's it's part of that it's part of that drive and I think it's the it's part of that sort of uh that that futile goal toward uh you know like the perfect story or the perfect scene hardly futile without that goal then one doesn't write the next story does one that's right. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, you gave a reading last night at which um, this was mentioned, but I, I think most of the, the attendees here wouldn't have heard it. But in your first novel um, about these, this story of a lost dog, or that's the pretext for the story as it unfolds, um, late in the novel, um, there's, it's, it's a novel in 99 parts, in 99 nights in Logar, and late in the novel there's this astonishing thing that happens. The, the text ceases to be in English at a moment when absolutely the reader wants it and needs it to be in English. And it's, uh, I think it's six, maybe even, se it's one of the longer sections, it's six or seven pages. And um, there's no, it's not like, ha ha reader, I'll give you a parse on the next section. It's just, sorry, not, not happening. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that choice, its implications and, and its need in light of what you just said about dissatisfaction. You know, and it's funny because that um, that section it it, uh, it upset quite a few people, and I, I you know it wasn't it wasn't my intention to upset anyone. That was that was uh, you know f uh, fundamentally a craft decision. I'd gotten to this point in the novel. I knew the entire novel was working its way up to this one story. It's um, it's it, it's the it's about the story of Watak. It's the story that I tell repeatedly in all of my work. If and um, and and I got to that point. And I knew I needed to tell this story. And as I began, again, it, it was that futile feeling of I, I just I knew I wasn't going to get it. I, I tried the scene um, in, in in different in different tenses. I tried different perspectives. I tried different voices. I tried. Um, and and it got to this point where I was completely stuck, and for 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 weeks and weeks I didn't write a word. It was this horrifying, terrifying feeling. Um, and then one day I went back to my father, and um, and you know the the story of Watuk, it's based on a true story. My my father's younger brother was uh, he was murdered during the war, and um, and my father, fortunately, you know he's been incredibly supportive of my work and of my attempts to sort of. Um, re record and or, or retell you know his stories and so he, he told me the the whole story again and it's a very difficult story for him to tell he, he, even even to this day you know it, it hurts him a great deal but for my sake he told the story and he told it beautifully but he told it in Pashto and I and I recorded the the whole story and I and I would listen to it and I would listen to it over and over again and I'll try to figure out how do I now translate this to the text and and I just couldn't do it. And I got to the point where I was like, I just told myself, well, why can't why can't I just put this story as it is in the same language that my father told it, in the beauty of his voice? And if some of my readership can't can't won't be able to grasp that, then then I think there's there's something in that as well because much of my much of my novel it's about it's about language and it's about translation, it's about inaccessibility and it's about these gaps in understanding um, and it's about absence as well. And so if that section just existed as an absence for the reader but but still maintained sort of its I, I don't want to say purity because it's not exactly purity but but there's something about Pashto in its in its original text as my father told it that I wanted to maintain and preserve it sort of as 
to, to honor his story. And, um, and, and, so, and so that's what I did, and I put it in there, and it, my, my editor initially was quite hesitant about it, and, and my agent had some questions about it, and, but when I sort of explained to them what I've explained to you, um, uh, I was very fortunate that they, they were like, okay, let's do it, <laughs> and then that's what we did. Yeah, and it's a, it's a, it, it works so well, and it ends up being moving through the resistance it, it, uh, it puts in the way of the reader, and it, that push is a force that the reader feels um, not excluded, but weirdly included. Um, and this, this ambition to, you know, include is certainly in a more atomized way present in the language of the haunting of Haji Hotak. Because you include, I think I counted them, something like 60 Pashto words, which are transliterated but are not defined. And so it's, there's no hint of exoticism or just sort of like, these are being put in there just to be precious and to, you know, um, uh, season the text so that it has a certain, no, these are just the words that are the correct words, I'm putting them in, and you'll figure it out, you know, or you, you don't need to. And I loved that aspect of it, because it, it, it suggested, once again, that the reader is to come to what you're doing. And yet, formally, with the stories, you know, um, you just told a, an extraordinarily sad story about your father's loss. And in the first book, a certain inability to imagine it, yeah? Um, and it raises the question, how does one give form to experiences like that, which certainly would include rage? And so, you know, for me in a lot of the stories in this collection, all of the stories are, are formally ingenious. The collection is framed by two stories that are written in direct address, beginning and ending. A U is implicated in the beginning and a U in the end two totally different yous, and as we move through the, the 10 stories between them, there are different formal approaches. And you know, they have no hint of kind of cleverness or like, ooh, why don't I try that? They all feel germane to the thing you're trying to do. So I think you will discover that when you read this collection. But giving form to rage, is rage a, a, a feeling that, that for you has a particular experiential meaning for your background, uh, you know, it's it, it's um it's funny. I think at times uh, rage can be, it can be debilitating. It can be paralyzing, especially uh, you know when I'm when I'm writing and I and I begin to consider you know these uh, the the last fifty years of ongoing warfare, the 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 superpowers that have invaded Afghanistan not once but twice, two different superpowers, two different invasions, two different occupations over the last fifty years. Um, you know the, the the war crimes that have been committed there, the bombings and the slaughter and the drone strikes and the night raids and and, and all of these atrocities and even now the continued um, the the sanctions that have been leveled against this country, one of the poorest countries in the world. That's you know sanctions that are largely going to starve and 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 harm the poorest and the most vulnerable people in the country. Not its not the current regime. And, you know, it, it can be debilitating, and it can be paralyzing, and it can leave you just sort of um, unable, to, unable to think through anything. But, but there's also a way that I think um, rage can be propulsive. I think there's a way that, that rage can be uh, deeply, uh, profoundly inspirational. You know, I think, uh, I think back to some of my favorite writers like um, Franz Fanon or, or, uh, or Malcolm X, who, you know, when they write... The, the, the rage seeps off the page. The, they, they don't hide from rage. They don't, uh, Franz Fanon especially, you know, there, there's these, he has these passages, and I first came to him, he's, he's a theorist, he's a, uh, he's a psychoanalyst, it's going to be boring writing, and then you read it, and, and the page weeps with anger, and, 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 and I think that was deeply inspirational for me as well, so that, you know, when I'm looking at a story now, and when I'm trying to, to capture that sense of rage, then uh, I'm trying to capture it through the form of the story itself. I'm trying to capture it through the language um, essential to the story. So for, you know, um, for Enough, which is, which is a story about a very angry, you know, old Afghan woman, um, it, it just, it, the, the entire story is, it's a single sentence. And, 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 and I made that decision because it just, it made sense to me in that instance that, that the sentence would just go on and on and on and that there wouldn't be any space for a breath or for a break for the reader. And I just wanted, I just wanted the reader to be sort of overwhelmed 
by by the immensity of everything she's gone through, but then by the but by also by the immensity of the emotion uh, that is present in the story as well. And uh, and I and I ended up I tried to I tried to do that through through the language itself. And so I think there's a way um, I don't know I guess uh, to to master rage through the form. What you do with the semicolon in your fiction, I kid you not. It's just the it's the varieties of way that you varieties of ways that you use the semicolon to be able to produce different effects which are um, uh, these varieties of emotional and tactical modulation that the stories possess and your 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 use of repetition you know your use of what amount to almost homeric epithets in which you have these tags um, in the story I'm not going to quote it properly but rambling is a word which keeps up over and over, uh, repeats over and over again, and her frustration at all the rambling. And first of all, the story's called Enough! Exclamation point, which is a little different. Um, it isn't, not to correct the author, a story in one sentence. It's a story in one sentence that ends, and then a number of shorter ones bring us to the end. But it's a change. It's when she gets the car, essentially, and she makes that decision to go back to Afghanistan, right? And then we learn that her, her attempt doesn't go far or well. That's right. <laughs> but what I'm struck by in the story, and which you may have heard, is uh, the repetition five times during the course of it, um, the incursion five times of the phrase, praise be to him, right? So uh, talk a little bit about that interruption uh, of her, of her of a deluge of rage by those three words, four words, yeah, you know, I mean, th th those those were moments. Again, yeah, I feel like I'm I'm contradicting myself because I say that I didn't want the reader to 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 take any breaths in the story. But those are the moments where the uh, they think the reader sort of is allowed a, a breath in the in the midst of the story. And you know, it's it's meant as it's meant as an evocation. It's meant as a as a sort of prayer. It's meant as a sort of uh, you know as a, um, a, a as a moment in which um, you know the uh, the 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 narrator her her sort of the, the, I I suppose that would be sort of her her philosophical backbone you know it, 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 the, the this narrator it's 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 very much you know it's based upon my my own grandmother who is a who is a deeply faithful deeply religious woman um, despite the the immense suffering she she'd gone through throughout throughout her life and uh, and so you know the 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 moments in which. I think she, and she would tell me this, that she, take, that she would take the most respite, that the moments in which she was most at peace was while she was at prayer. And she would do these five daily prayers up until the very end of her life, God rest her soul. And, um, and, it, and it became this, you know, this ritualistic, but also this meditative uh, time for her uh, throughout her life, you know, uh, up, until her, up until her death. And I think that's what, I think that's what I was sort of trying, attempting to accomplish or to replicate or to, um, or, or to mirror in the story is this is this is this it's this prayerful moment, it's this meditative moment amidst all the sorrow. So in, in the interruption, in, in the course of a day's rage, there's this there's this return to moments of faith and prayer. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So formally, that's just I mean, it's ingenious. I say from the outside, um, but that's you know looking at it as we experience it it's a different thing altogether because the form of the story produces the experience of the grandmother's rage and faith. And then the tenderness and sorrow of it going essentially nowhere. But it goes one place, which is to us. And so that's the ultimate you know, beauty of the tale. And um, so many of your stories manage that kind of transference from character to, to reader and the experience of it. Um, and I should yeah. just briefly say that yes, I don't think there's anything kinder you could say about myself or my writing than to than to compliment you know my semicolons and <laughs> my punctuation and my grammar because um, I just I'm, I'm I'm such a I'm such a dork when it comes to my sentences and I and I spend so much time on them and I you know I've studied them for so long and uh, and to to hear you say these things is just you know you're you're making me blush. <laughs> Happy to. You know, all writers want to be complimented on their on their syntax and their punctuation. So if you're at a party with a writer, you just and you really want to meet them and you're really shy, you just say, I'm sorry to interrupt, but 
I have to talk about the colon you used in the sentence on page 526. And you will have their undivided attention. That's actually genius. I can't imagine a better it's way. It's true. To... Don't let this get out, though. Shh. <laughs> Keep it between us. Um, spiritual life in fiction. Um, it, it has a, 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 a narrow but deep tradition. And it's, it's much misunderstood, I think, as a subject for fiction because it so easily suggests um, some kind of evangelism mm -hmm. at work as opposed to an attempt at a depiction of faith. And there are contemporary writers who in subterranean ways are preoccupied with putting faith on the page and one of them would be unlikely as it seems, George Saunders, mm -hmm. who's a practicing Buddhist and whose stories, um, the longest ones in every collection are an imagining of the bardo, the walk towards death. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's not like he puts a, a, you know, prayer flags at the top of the story so you know, ah, Buddhist tale. You know? <laughs> Rather, he's figuring out a, an allegorical way to sub subterranean, subterraneanly um, do something with his understanding of what an individual's relationship to something unseen but deeply felt can be. And I wonder what, I mean, in this, formally in the story that we just discussed and you read so beautifully, there is absolutely a, 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 a cunning use of, you know, the idea of prayer in the form. I wonder what, you know, in, in your acknowledgments, you know, there's, you acknowledge a, a higher power. Yes, and you quote from the Quran. And yeah, right. I, I would, if you're comfortable with it, I wonder if, the, if there have been challenges for you as a man of faith, as a man who comes from a family of, of believers and who knows the Quran so well, how does that, um, how does that, how is that in dialogue with your ambitions as a fiction writer? If one could, you can say, it's not, we move on, but I think it might be more than that. No, no, I think it's actually sort of um, uh, central to my, to my struggle as a, as a, as a fiction writer, you know, I'm, it's, I, I, in one way or another, I would say even the stories that are not really about faith or, or not explicitly about faith or God are still about, are deeply, deeply about faith and, and God and, and, and that struggle as well. I think, um, you know, for me, when I think back on um, one of the writers that had a profound impact on me was, uh, was Dostoevsky and in, in particular his, his book, uh, the, the Brothers Karamazov and in, um, and in that exploration of faith, which was, um, it, it, I found it incredibly compelling and I found it incredibly um, satisfying as well because, uh, because it's, 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 a, it's an exploration of faith but also of doubt. And for me, those two things are always circulating around one another. And, um, and, so, and, and, and that's not just like in the, in the religious sense of doubt, does, does God exist or not? But, but the way that doubt I think is sort of essential, at least to my mind, to, to fiction writing itself. I think if you go into a story and you know what the story is about and you know what's going to happen next and you know your characters and you're not doubting yourself and you're not doubting this, like, I, I just don't think that, that that story will then, even if it gets written, it's not going to be the story that it, that it needed to be. And so for me, doubt is so essential um, to, to my fiction writing process that, that faith sort of gets mixed into that as well. It's fascinating. Okay. Um, I think we should begin by taking a few questions. And so uh, I believe there are microphones. I believe there are people who can assist. And so I hope you have questions for Jamil. I see one over here, yes, and, uh, no. and another behind there. So we have a couple so far. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. So um, as a, a former refugee and as a former mother of refugee kids, you just took me through the whole, like my previous life and this life and di displacing and everything. And my, I have a question that's just related to all what you said there. So what I saw in that story is um, a, a long series of trauma and uh, depression, anxiety, and uh, that comes uh, with living in the war zone and living in all the hopelessness that your family lived in and then later being displaced in, in the refugee camp and then come to the new country and facing a new uh, uh, series of trauma. So for the, the first time when I heard you, I thought that you were like 
one of the adults, or uh, at least uh, in an age that you remembered all that. Then when you talked, I just thought, oh, you were in the age of, of my kids, and you don't remember any of that. So you faced this experience, the secondary trauma through the stories that your family, and especially your grandma, That's right. um, told you, which is great because I didn't see that you were not part of that as an adult. My question here is, is that story for you is uh, a way of um, post-trauma storytelling process to go through resilience and healing from that uh, experience? Or it is a way of communication with the new fellow citizens in the second country that you live in and just asking or communicating, voicing about your story and asking for help understanding and seeing us as a refugee, as another people that we came from very wealthy and rich life in our previous life. And please accept us as we are, we are or should, what, what should we do? Should we assimilate? Should we rage? We, should we voice our anger? What to do that you will see us? What was the goal of that? Uh, like, was any of that was the goal? Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, uh, so, no, I think, yeah, I think it's both. I think, you know, I think uh, you've really sort of uh, broken through to what I was trying to attempt to do with this story. I think, you know, first and foremost, the, the story, it's, um, it's, an, it's an ode to my grandmother and, and, uh, and to many grandmothers, Afghan grandmothers who, had, who I'd known throughout my life, who'd gone through this immense amount of suffering, all these traumas, all this turmoil, and who still, in the end, you know, would, would, would hold your hand before you went to sleep, who would sing you songs, and who still maintained this, this immense sense of, uh, of tenderness and love, and they, they didn't allow, and not to say they shouldn't have, but, uh, but at least in my case, you know, it was, it, it was never this thing that, they, that she carried into, into our relationship, or held against me, or, or something like that, and so I think there is, uh, if, if not, you know, uh, I, I think it's certainly rooted in this idea of, of the hope for healing, of, and of a life beyond the turmoil and of a life beyond the war. But, but as you mentioned, you know, I'm very conscious of the fact that my audience is, it's largely going to be Americans. And, and uh, although I'm always incredibly delighted to see, you know, uh, Afghan readers um, and, uh, and, and to see an Afghan audience, um, uh, I, do, I do make a very concerted effort to make sure that you know, that my American audience does not forget everything that's happened the last 50 years and that they do not forget um, everything that's ongoing, you know, with the current refugee crisis, with the current uh, food crisis, with the current uh, medical crisis. And, um, and as much as possible, you know, if my, if, my, if, my, uh, if my writing does have sort of a political ad objective, I would say it's exactly that, that I, that I don't let them forget. Thank you. I think we have several questions back there, yeah. We have a student there and, and here. Yes, please. Oh, me. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much. It was very moving, and the way you were reading it is just wow. Um, so I have a lot of Afghan students in my class, especially um, after, like, especially after Taliban took over Afghanistan because they started evacuating. So. Um, I see a lot of emotions there, and they are outraged about a lot of things. And um, my question is, do you have rage? Because you do have voice. You have this book, you can, you know, you can talk to people and, um, uh, yeah, do you have rage? And if you do, um, I like how uh, you put it into the secondary trauma because you are definitely affected by everything that was happening and is happening, but how is this rage then being put into action or however politically we see it happening <laughs> in this conference? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I would say I do have rage. Um, you know, I, I very recently uh, came back from Afghanistan. I'd, uh, I'd, I was visiting... Um, for a month, and um, and I was there, and I was uh, and I was speaking to um, you know family members, relatives, neighbors about their um, about their experiences, 
um, uh, currently in Afghanistan, and you know, I have I have little cousins that uh, you know they can't go to school because there's the school ban uh, for for girls, and um, and they were absolutely devastated by that. I have other cousins in Logar who. Um, you know, they, they, there's been recent floodings in Logar, and it's been it's wiped out all these crops, and um, and and then because of the you know the ongoing sanctions, they're they're unable to um, you know they're barely able to to feed themselves, and they're going through a lot of trouble in that regard. And and um, you know, I was asking them about the, the 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 past 20 years and what they'd gone through living in living in a battlefield, living in between the on one side the the violence of the Taliban, and on the other side the violence of of the American and the the Afghan government forces, and um, and so you know, I, I have to say, I, I don't think I I don't think I do enough. Um, uh, I'm I'm currently I'm working on a piece about that their very experiences. I'm working on a piece about that situation. I'm you know I'm a writer, and and so I'm going to write about it, and that's sort of what I that's what I do. It does feel uh, I, you know it can make me feel incredibly <laughs> useless at times. I have to say. You know, the, there are many occasions where I'll be sitting at my desk and and typing away, and then and then stopping and just thinking about everything that's going on and uh, and feeling, um, you know, uh, uh, utterly useless. That the, that there's nothing here I can do, and the, you know, and there's all these people, these uh, lawyers and and social activists who've who've been making all these different attempts, but. Um, uh, but but I but I guess uh, you know I'm I'm going to continue to write and I'm con going to continue to try to say what I can and and I you know and, and and thank you for your work as well I you know I I'm also I'm a, a, a I'm a professor and I'm hoping that you know through 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 education and through teaching that 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 might be another way to sort of uh, fight back. <laughs> just on uh, before we take our next question, just on the subject of this, I believe you had a question. Um, if we could bring the mic down to to this person. Um, you know, on the subject of trauma and, uh, you know, how one writes about it, you know, Francis Haugen was saying that um, when parents who've lost a child to suicide um, go through their feeds after their death on their phone, you know, the al they see how the algorithms, I'm quoting, uh, suck them into a hole. And, you know, in terms of the, you know, the fundamental uselessness that one often hears that writers feel that they're, oh, they're, I'm just sitting at a desk, I'm, you know, what, what help am I being? You know, when you listen to a story like Enough, you are being sucked into, you know, something very different. And it's not, you know, it, it's, it's not, and it shouldn't be seen as um, a balm. Uh, it's, it's rather something deeper. You know, the reader isn't being taken out of themselves. I feel like the reader is being put into themselves in a fundamental way. And, you know, that's your work. You know, and the feeling of failure, the feeling of uselessness, is the, one of the motors of, I think, production because you have to make it meaningful. Yeah. Very kind of you to say. Uh, hi. Thank you very much for you for the conversation, Sharaglast, which literally translates into welcome, welcome to Bard. I am from Afghanistan. Uh, I'm a senior student. My name is Jamshed Mohammadi, and. I wanted to say that a lot of stories that are written about Afghanistan, their, their central focus is mostly violence, trauma, patriarchy. But uh, from my personal observation, I feel like they fail to talk about the origins of that, for example, the violence, the trauma, and the patriarchy, as, in, as if that exists, as, as if that is a part of the society in Afghanistan. I am fascinated by your work because you reflect on how, what are the fundamental the underlying problems as to why uh, the society in Afghanistan is patriarchal, why violence exists. So right now I am trying to write, my, uh, write a story of my, of my uh, experience of evacuating Afghanistan because I was recently evacuating, evacuated. And my question is, can we uh, combine, uh, for example, our story with some of the theories that are, uh, for example, uh, with regards to international uh, relations and how, for example, geopolitical uh, aspects played a role in the collapse of Afghanistan. So I want to combine theoretical aspects of my analysis with my original story, and I wanted to ask you, how would you go about that? Um, you know, um, uh, you know. I mean, first of all, to say that that it's certainly it's certainly something that you know you can do, and that. 
Um, you know, it's, it's difficult for me to say right now how exactly you might go about doing that. But, um, but, but there, are certainly, there are certainly models I think you can look to this sort of um, this, uh, maintaining a balance between a, a personal narrative while also um, bringing in the context of larger um, sociopolitical issues. I think um, one of the first people you might want to look to, is, and I mentioned him earlier, is, uh, is, is Franz Fanon, who, you know, quite a, a lot of his work, he'll, he'll bring in his, his personal experiences, his own memories of, of experiencing racism and colonization and these different things. But then, of course, he's, he's also a theorist, so he's always bringing in these different, um, you know, sociopolitical elements, these different ideas that, that weigh upon his experience. So um, th there are models out there. The main thing, I, you know, and now that I'm, now that I'm thinking through it, I, I'm I, I think my, my main suggestion would be um, uh, is to look for those models. I think writers like Franz Fanon is a good one. And, um, and I'll think about it, and I'm going to talk to you afterward, and I'm going to give you other suggestions as well, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Do we have another question? Up there, yeah. Tomas? Thank you. Um, listening to uh, your very captivating reading um, and now listening to uh, the conversation of both of you, what emerges for me is something like a space in relation or a world of relation uh, that cannot be and maybe resists to be uh, essentialized in one or the other place or anchored uh, in one or the other territory, but create a space that exists through the way in which the story is being conveyed as a possibility of relation. I don't have a better word right now. And so um, my question would be the incredible momentum with which this enough pushes for something, if something like that possibility of a re relationality that exists in something that has to be found, so to speak, if that is a momentum and push in your in your project of writing. And the related question to that would be a follow-up to the previous one. If other writers or thinkers, <laughs> uh, if there are other writers and thinkers, maybe in addition to Fanon, that you see as interlocutors or partners in that kind of project? Oh, um, that's, a, that's a really fantastic question. You know, um, I, think, uh, I think absolutely, I think your reading is absolutely correct. I think the, the momentum of that story is toward this, um, this idea of, uh, uh, you know, of putting two, these, these two separate objects, these two separate experiences in, in relation to one another. And then, and, and much of my work is, is driven by this desire to, um, to leap between or to leap into um, these different gulfs in an understanding, right? And uh, that's, it's something that I've grew, grown up with my entire life because I grew up with these, these incredible, beautiful stories, but I always had this sense that there was something about these narratives that were locked away from me. And especially when it came to the most, the most traumatic and the most difficult to tell stories, the stories of loss, the stories of murder, the stories of, of the bombings of the war, um, those stories became so difficult to tell that, that, there was, that, I, could, that I could sense in my, in my parents and in my relatives that there was something inside of them that I could never access because I couldn't completely access those stories. And so, you know, I think when, when I write now, it's oftentimes, it's, 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 it's rooted in this similar desire to, um, uh, to uh, if not to m leap that gulf, if not to overcome that gulf, then, then to be immersed in it and to struggle with it and to think through it on, on the page itself. So we have a question up uh, here by the board. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I loved your performance. I loved how you read what you wrote, but it also made me want to ask you, could you talk a little bit more about the craft of how you went from oral stories where people use inflection and hand gestures and they smack you on the shoulder <laughs> and they point 
to words that are on a page and just have to have life on their own. Could you talk about that, that craft? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I've been talking about that craft for like the last uh, 10 years. Um, you know, there's this beautiful novel by, um, by uh, uh, Patrick uh, Chamazou. I butchered his name, one of my favorite writers, but it's a French name, so you, please forgive me. Um, Chamazou. <laughs> there we go. Uh, it's called Solibo Magnificent, and it's, and it's, it's, it's actually the, the entire, that entire novel, it revolves around that very question of how does one go about taking these beautiful oral stories with their inflections and their um, you know, their stuttering and their pitches and their, the, 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 the melody and the rhythm of the, of the you know, the, the human voice, and you put those onto dead letters on a page. Like, how do you capture that? And so in that novel, the, these, there's this ongoing struggle between Salibo, the master storyteller, and uh, Wazou Deschamps, uh, the, um, the writer, whose name also happens to be uh, Patrick Chamozou, I think. And, um, and it's this ongoing struggle, and throughout the narrative, it's all about uh, Wazou Deschamps trying to write down Salibo's stories. And, and again and again he fails, and again and again uh, 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 Salibo tells him, like, you know, you're, you're missing the entire point. And so, but by the end of the story, what ends up happening is that you know, it's, it's very much a story about of, of, of Patrick sort of coming to terms with his own inability to, to capture that narrative. But what happens is that his language, by the end of the story, it becomes so beautiful. And in his attempts to, in his failed attempts to capture that the life of the, he calls it the word, oral storytelling. To capture the life of the word, uh, he still, he writes these mesmerizing, beautiful, rhythmic passages, even as he's sort of bemoaning himself. And so for me, that was, that was deeply inspirational because I think even, even if you fail, there's something to be said about the attempt itself. And so, you know, with that story, that was, that was just me trying to tell a story how my grandmother might have told it. And I think it failed immensely. But I think there's still some value in that failure as well. Would you feel terrible if I asked you to read just one little bit of that again out of context, just as potentially an answer to that gentleman's question? Certainly. Okay. If you just want to start from wherever you want and just go to there or somewhere in that, you know, wherever it makes sense for you to start. <clears throat> A trail of ash following her from one end of the world to the other, from Logar to Peshawar to Birmingham to Hayward to Broderick to Bridgeway to her favorite seat just in front of the television, blocked by her rambling daughters and her rambling son, and now his rambling son, that is the very same grandson she had sung to sleep for five years, the same grandson whose ass she had wiped until he was in first grade, until they moved him into a room with his brothers in this too big house with his too many doors, too many windows, too many lights, too many televisions, too many memories, as in, for example, the night her son's wife discovered that her brothers had been murdered in Logar for nothing, for no one, in snowfall, just a mile or so from the spot where Watuk had been murdered for nothing, for no one, in snowfall. So, I mean, just from the standpoint of, of how is he doing it, or pretend he's not here now, he's gone, where did he go, I don't know. We can say that we notice that he is using the repetition of from, from, to, to, and her, and her, and him, until, until, too many, too many, for nothing, for no one, in snowfall, for nothing, for no one, in snowfall. Since Homer, repetition has been a fundamental unit of, of comprehension for the reader. So some people will say you repeat so that the person reciting can, can remember it more easily. But the person who's going to remember it more easily is the person who's going to register it, hearing it, and that's the reader. So the role of repetition, I think, is, is it, you, your ability to weigh the, the moment of repetition. It's extraordinary in the way that it delivers just this incredible moment of feeling. So that's, you know, we might call it craft, but it, 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 without diminishment, but it's, it's really remarkable art. And um, I think we've reached the end of our, our time. And I just, I, I want to say how grateful I am that you came and you shared your work with us and how generous you've been. And I wish you just, selfishly I say this, more books and more books soon. So, uh, so let's thank, thank so Jamil. Well, thank you. <laughs>